Hey, welcome to the Refton Church YouTube channel. My name is Scott. I'm the lead pastor here at Refton Church. Now, this is an introduction to a new video series that I'm actually involved with, but I'm not producing or anything like that. Um, I was invited uh, over to Lampeter Church of the Brethren uh, by Pastor Chris Shelley, uh, who happens to be a really good friend of mine. I've, I've had the privilege of getting to know him and some other pastors in our local area uh, you know, over the past several years. So he invited my, me and, and some others over to talk about uh, questions of faith. Uh, so we're calling this series Frequently Asked Questions. So that way we can pretty much talk about anything. Uh, so we're, you know, you're going to hear discussions on the Trinity. Why is there evil in the world? Uh, what does Judgment Day look like? All, just anything and everything. So I hope you enjoy it. Check it out. So welcome back to our Frequently Asked Questions series. My name is Chris Shelley, the lead pastor at Lampier Church of the Brethren. And I'm joined to get today with uh, Josh Marcroft, our youth director, uh, Scott McFeet, lead pastor at Refton Church, and Joey Schiffer, director of student and digital ministry at Refton Church. And so our big question is, what happens to the person that never hears the gospel? Are they saved or not saved? And so guys, there seems to be like at least two very basic camps of where people land on this question. And they're known as the inclusivists and the exclusivists. I think the title kind of gives away their perspective, but the inclusivist says that, sure, someone could probably never hear the gospel and then be saved anyway and be included in God's saving work. And the exclusivist argument is pretty exclusive in that Jesus is the only way, period, full stop. And so we have some scripture to look at. I'll, I'll start us off with the inclusivist argument. So the inclusivist argument, looking at Romans chapter 2. Paul begins to make this, this long explanation about the importance of the law and pagan worship or Gentiles and pagans and whether or not they're aware of their misgivings, their sins because of the law and whether or not that has even saving work. Um, in chapter two, verse 12, he starts off for all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it's written that not hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law that will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves. And so the big argument here is that these Gentile pagan worshipers, because they don't know the law, they don't know Christ, then they're not going to be held accountable to those things. And God in his mercy and God in his grace will include them in the saving work. The other one that's often looked at um, as being a supporter of this inclusive argument is 1 John chapter 1, no, chapter 4, sorry. Looking at verses 7 through 10, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And we've been hearing this argument a lot, especially in sort of the, the cultural version of Christianity that's emerging right now, that God is love and that love is just covering all kinds of sins, all kinds of mistakes, and that almost like God's love is also a permissive 
love. He's just allowing all kinds of things to take place because that's the most loving thing to do. And so this is the argument that, well, we know that God's character is loving. And it looks like Paul's making the argument that those who don't have the law and don't know Jesus, well, because God is loving and God is merciful and God is gracious, that they will be included in God's saving work. So in a nutshell, this is sort of the inclusive argument. Um, but let's talk about the exclusive argument. Yeah, the exclusive argument, like you said, uh, claims that Jesus is the only way uh, to be justified. And that comes from maybe a John fourteen six would be an example of that. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Mm-hmm. Uh, but actually, the exclusive argument can be made from actually some of the verses that <laughs> you just read for the inclusive argument, which is kind of interesting because in a lot of these situations, verses are, are taken out of context. Are you saying um, I'm taking things out of context? I'm not saying that you personally are. I appreciate you taking it upon yourself to read the inclusive view and take one for the team there. Sure. Um but I would say that... I'm sensing a little history. <laughs> <laughs> Some mild history. Yeah. A rivalry, maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, but so, so they'll take these verses out of context uh, to make it mean what they want it to mean. And that, sure. We talked about that last week uh, in our karma video as well. So yeah. it, it's something that I'm sure will keep coming up because right. verses are often taken out of context. Mm-hmm. Yes. But but in this Romans passage that, that you mentioned, uh, you read verse 14, for when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law unto themselves, even though they do not have the law. You, you would maybe stop there and say, okay, the Gentiles who were not given the law, not under the law, are okay. And, and by God's grace, uh, they'll be saved. But if you just go one more verse into verse 15, it says they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. And so this is actually coming on the back of Romans 1 uh, verses 18 through 23, which talks about general revelation being enough to to condemn a man. And part of that part of being human is that you have the law written on your heart. And that is enough to condemn you. Um, Anyone else? I think he needs to defend or at least explain what general yeah, revelation is. Yeah, I was thinking could, that. Yeah. You mm. can't go using words like that <laughs> around here, Josh. You get it. General revelation uh, is the things like creation that is observable by everybody. Uh, in Romans 1, 18 through 23, it talks about uh God revealing himself in creation, mainly his, in, his invisible attributes. And so we see the grandeur of creation, uh, the complexity of it, um, and how it works together. And, and one would, can't help but look at that, and God would say that points to himself as creator. Um, general, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, you look, you look up at the nighttime stars on a clear night, and you're like, wow. The because, heavens declare. Yeah, the heavens the glory declare of the, Lord. the glory of the Lord. There it is. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. So, would you also lump in morality into general revelation? I would I would think so. And even this verse talks about uh, the conscience. Yeah. Um, and so I think the conscience that God gives each person yeah. uh, is one of the ways that he kind of, one, curbs the depravity of man, but also mm. uh, points yeah. them uh, to the idea of himself being the absolute moral yeah. Uh, yeah. bedrock of life. Yeah. So even Romans 2, f- looking at verse 15 then, even says that like, so God's law is written on in the heart of, and we would say every man. Yeah. Like it's in there. Yeah. So whether or not they accept or believe is they're they're either suppressing that truth or acknowledging that truth. Yeah. Um, and the, we would say those who are not um, are, su- are suppressing what they know. Yes, yeah, that is right. in Romans 1. What about God is love? What about, that, what about that passage, man? What about God is love? Yeah, so in 1 John 4, 8, as you read, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. And okay, God is love. One might look at that and say, well, 
how could how could he condemn anybody who 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 doesn't know about him that doesn't seem very loving but even if you go just one more verse verse 9 in this the love of god was made manifest among us that god sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him and so christ uh manifested the incarnate christ is uh how the peak of god's revelation to man and it says here that we we live through him it, uh, that seems pretty exclusive to me. It yeah. doesn't say you can live through his son and a multitude of other people or other ways or other ideologies uh, through his son. Right. So what I think I really hear is God is love, so loving that he sent his son into the world. It's not through his love that you are saved, but it's through his son that you are saved. Absolutely, yeah. His love was manifested by sending his son so you had a way to be saved yes so that's very different than <laughs> very much so being saved because god is loving yeah right so i think we need to like unpack probably our understanding of how salvation works right because i think this idea i mean the, the question is can someone who never heard the gospel be saved i think is taking into question how does one become saved, right? Yeah. Because if we're saying that there's another way beyond Jesus Christ, then all of a sudden everything I think that the Bible has taught us comes into question. Yeah. What do you mean there's multiple paths, there's multiple ways to be saved? So how does one become saved? Well, I mean... What does that mean? There's a movement that is going on right now and has been for a while. It's a, a big one called universalism. Mm -hmm. And correct me if I'm wrong, that seems to fall in the camp of, um, what was the first thing you the said? The inclusivist. Inclusivist. Yeah. There yeah. it is. Yeah. So universalism is just the belief that every in, in the end, everyone's going to be welcomed into God's arms because he's love, right? right. And, you know, there's there's that. So... Uh, but that's actually contrary to the message of Jesus Christ, uh, the gospel, right. uh, which is why we keep landing on the, the exclusivism part. Uh, because, yeah, as, as Josh already said, no one comes to God except through Jesus. That's pretty exclusive. Yeah. So now we're going to talk about his message. Um, you know, what is this gospel? How can someone be saved? Well, what do you think, Joey? Well, clearly scripture is very clear about how we're saved. I mean, yeah. it's by grace, uh, through faith in Christ. By grace alone, I mean, we're touching on the five solas here at this point. Uh, I love my church history and stuff like that. You know that. Uh -huh. um, and so it's like, I think the five solas encapsulate it. Uh, is that the right word? Well, yeah. uh, by grace alone. It's by God's grace. He gives us grace. It's a gift. Uh, through faith alone in Christ alone. And that's how we see salvation work. And that's why it's so important to share this specific gospel of mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I mean, Paul addresses this in Romans. How will they be saved unless they hear the word? Right. How will they hear the word unless somebody preaches them? How will someone preach unless they go? Mm -hmm. It is very important that we're very particular yeah. about the gospel being through Christ alone and him alone. Yeah. Can we talk about grace for just a second? Just in, let's just yeah. unpack those three words that's, real yeah, quick. Right. So, so grace is an undeserved gift. It's an act of kindness from God. Yeah. So like if, if, you know, we are saved first by grace, it's a, it's a gift. Um, what are we saved from? We're saved from eternal separation from God, hell, yeah. um, you know. Uh, so we are, we are saved be only because of his grace. It's not because of anything that we could do yeah. or our good works or performance in this life. That has nothing to do with it. It has everything to do with his grace, yeah. an undeserved gift. Okay. And, and actually, then, maybe yeah. before we uh, jump further, uh, it might be necessary to talk about what we're saved from and why it's necessary to be saved. Because you said, um, sorry, what it Saved from God's wrath. Saved from God's wrath. Sure, why? Yeah. Why? Uh, 
why would we have God's wrath? Or why is God's wrath coming? Yeah, why is that coming to me? I mean, I'm sorry. I thought we already <laughs> talked about this in Judgment Day. <laughs> mm. Well, yeah, we did. But yeah. maybe this is somebody, you know, this is somebody's first time sure. diving in. So what sure. No, that's really good. It's God's because we're, we are all sinners. We've all fallen mm-hmm. short of the glory of God. Um, there's not one of us who can live a perfect life. Uh, even our even our good deeds are as filthy rags. That was what Isaiah something or fifty three yeah. something somewhere around there. Somewhere in We're there. allowed to do that. We're <laughs> pastors. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, like um, you know, the Bible's very very clear that we are sinful. Period. Uh, we are in need of a savior who can bring us back to God. Uh, this, this sin, the thing that we call sin, uh, it, it's this, you know, it's our, our natural bent to do what God doesn't want us to do, if that makes sense. I mean, that's mm-hmm. just sinful. Uh, and that separates us from him. It goes all the way back to the original sin with Adam and Eve in the garden. Right. Um, so, you know, I don't know if you want to go there yet, but, uh, you know, we, we, um, we cannot get to God. In a, we cannot have a right relationship with God without someone stepping in for us, living that perfect life that God required, uh, paying the price of you know, our sin and taking on the punishment that we deserved. Uh, and that's what Jesus does. Jesus on the cross took on our punishment that we deserved, mm-hmm. um, even though he didn't deserve it. He lived a sinless life. Hebrews is clear with that. The, you know, the rest of Scripture is clear. Um, but he chose to go to the cross. He chose to take on our sins. He chose to conquer death and sin. And now he holds the keys to death in Hades. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's the one that decides who gets in and who gets out. This is why John fourteen six comes up. You know, He's the only way. Yeah. He's yeah. the only truth. Mm-hmm. No one comes to the Father except through him. Um, So, you know, again, it goes back to, I think what I was already saying, we can't do anything um, to get that sort of status that we're okay with God. And then we're just going to live happily ever after with him. We can't, there's nothing we can do. We're already, uh, it says you've said many times, we are in a desperate state. Yeah. That is our life and our reality. Romans one to three Paul's building an argument that no one no one has any excuse for the sin in their lives and 323 is the one that's quoted most often that all, everyone's fallen short mm-hmm. if you continue further to 623 he explains that the wage of sin is death and so clearly there's a, a, like a price to be paid yeah and and you said yeah Jesus mm-hmm. paid that price. Yeah. But the good news is that Jesus paid that price. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Yeah. That's and the good news. Yeah. And that's how grace fits into it. Grace right. was an undeserved gift. Like yeah. we didn't deserve Jesus to come and die for us. Right. Uh, but he did. Mm-hmm. And he, be, he was able to uh, take on the punishment for all of our sin because he, he was God and because he was fully 100% man as well. Uh, he's the only one that could have done that. Um, it's just, that speaks of the incarnation and all that kind of thing. But um, it's just, uh, you know, we need to realize the, the state our heart is in without Jesus. Um, and when we put our faith in Jesus, um, we're now adopted into his family. Mm-hmm. Not because of anything we've done, but because of what he did, because of his love for us. Right. Uh, so that that's the gospel. Um, that's that's grace. That's why grace is an undeserved gift. And what was the other two solos you said? <laughs> grace uh, alone, faith alone, in faith Christ alone. alone. We already said that. Yeah, yeah, I made that case. In Christ alone. Yeah, yeah. So, so it is through Jesus and only Jesus that someone can get to God. And the the question was. You know, how can someone be saved? Well, in the way that looks like, it is through Jesus, period. Right. So, um, you know, with us as being 
beings who can make conscious moral decisions, you know, we're able to make that decision of, hey, am I going to, am I going to uh, believe in Jesus or am I not? And when I say believe, I mean like, you know, I, I often say a believing loyalty. Um, choose this day whom you will serve. But for me and my household, we will choose the Lord. Uh, yeah, right. there, there's this, this yeah. thread of loyalty through, throughout all of this. Um, and I, I think, you know, it, it comes down to, um, do you see Jesus Christ as your king or not? I also think of the psalm where it says those who put uh, their trust in you will not be put to shame. I always like to encourage people, if you do not know Christ, throw yourself upon that rock. Mm. Put yourself in his care. Uh, trust him. He will pay for your sins. Mm -hmm. and, and there is a, such a gravity to it all. I think of Ezekiel 18, uh, verse 4. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. And the soul who sins shall die. That's heavy stuff. Right. Mm. And this is the beauty of grace is that it's a gift we don't deserve. Life in yeah. Christ. Yeah. Uh, and God also gives us his mercy. He withholds what we do deserve. Death. Mm -hmm. And it's the gorgeousness of the gospel. Um, those who put their trust in him will never be put to shame. So. Yeah. So we have grace alone. Through faith alone. It's, it's God's grace. Not on power our works. Mm -hmm. Right. So if I'm looking even at... Uh, Galatians chapter 3 verse 10 and 11 for as many as are in the works of the law are under a curse for it is written cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them verse 11 now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident for the righteous man shall live by faith however the law is not of faith on the contrary he who practices them shall live by them Verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, as it's written. So even in verse 11, we see that the righteous man lives by faith. So it begins with this guy that's on this, this, this tribesman or this, this guy that's never heard the gospel, who's isolated from the world. How can he be saved, if at all, by God's grace alone, not because of his works or because of the law, but then it gets it gets more exclusive as we go through each of these statements mm -hmm. by their faith alone. So d what does this man put his faith in that's living by himself, isolated from the world? Is it in Christ Jesus? Cause that's the third one in Christ alone, or is it in something else in salvation? We try to be ex as clear as possible is mm -hmm. through Christ Jesus and Christ alone not through another form because I think the moment we even give any wiggle room to say that it could be another way, we open ourselves up to a whole lot of other problems yeah. about the, about salvation, the atoning work of Christ and even just the character of God. Yeah. Yeah. Can I, can I go to the, just a little bit of the infant discussion? Yeah. If you want to do uh, that. I mean, cause I kind of, you know, you guys know I struggled with that this week as we were, uh, preparing for this, you know, and the, it, it could easily be said, well, okay, I can understand the, the guy on the beach, the, right. the, the island, the remote <laughs> island. That's usually uh, the way it's portrayed, right. yes. But yeah. what about the infant? What about the, maybe the mentally impaired? Mm -hmm. uh, what about the, the, you know, the stillborn or whatever? Um, they didn't do anything, you know? Um, they didn't, Right. They didn't make a choice. They didn't say the sinner's prayer. Um, you know what I'm saying? So, so what does God do with this infant? Sure. So I think this question is different than the original question. Okay. But I do think this is where I think people will logically, if they were just left with the first question and ended, mm -hmm. they would start to question this. It probably would eventually lead them to this yeah, question. Yeah. It's not the same question though. Um, and so we could probably say there's, there's at least two forms of sin there's that we think of in general about who we are. And that's the imputed, the original sin that comes through Adam, um, through one man sin entered the world, right? Yeah. That, yeah. that, right. So 
this original sin that every person is born with sin nature. Mm -hmm. There's no one that is born without that. Right. But then we also talk about what we call moral sin, which are those things that, that we do that we physically choose to do or mentally do, um, where we either steal physically or, or maybe we covet, or maybe it's adultery, and that's even adultery committed within our hearts, as Jesus explains in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 to 7. So even the things that we do inside ourselves, whether it's idolatry or adultery committed within our heart, that's just as weighty as doing it physically in the, in the existence sure. world, right? Yeah. So there's these two kinds of sin. So we would probably say, of course, that the unborn baby, the infant, the child, um, or, or the, or anyone that's, you know, beyond a conscious sentient ability isn't making moral choices, but they would still have original sin from from the time that they've been conceived through one man sin entered the world so that that is still there the sin is still there yeah yeah that's sin nature so then the question is what does jesus do with that right. um, at the end of the day it is through his grace right so whether he chooses to save this infant or not it would be through grace now I happen to land on the opinion that, you know, when I read scripture and I take all the evidence into consideration, seems to me like infants, you know, are with Jesus. Right. Infants who die are with Jesus. I mean, there are other arguments out there, but for me, that's, that's where I've, I've landed. And that, you're right, that is a different episode, um, if, <laughs> if we ever did it. We ever did that one, um, yeah. But I, I just know, like, it was the first thing I thought of when I read this question. Like, okay, I, right. I know where you guys are going to go, but what about the infants? Like, mm. you know. Right. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and I happen to fall in that camp with you. I think I lean towards there uh, based on the biblical evidence. But it probably is worth noting that like you said, whether God chooses to, to save the infant, the unborn, or not, uh, he is still just, and he is still good. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Even if that maybe doesn't yeah. line up with our idea of good. Um, we talked about that in one of our previous episodes. Um, a lot of times we even, I think our culture really glorifies this idea of innocence, especially at a young age, children, mm -hmm. things like that, babies being innocent. And perhaps in some sense they are because they aren't making those personal sin decisions and things like that. Um, but there still is the problem of original sin. Right. And so that's, again, we can actually find hope in the gospel. Can we find, we, well, there's not a Bible verse that exactly says right. unborn children will be saved. Um, Wouldn't that be nice? It, I know, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. It's a lot easier. Um, but we know God's character. We know he's gracious. And we know if a child were to be saved, it would only be through grace, yes. not through their own innocence. And that's a really important thing. Uh, even that, it, I mean, once I, if we start advocating that uh, a baby is innocent in its own self right. of you know, original sin, they're not innocent of original sin, now we're not in gospel anymore. Right. We're not at all. The beauty of the gospel is that Jesus' blood even has the power to go that far. Right into the womb, you know, and, and save. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely, I'm with you guys where I lean yeah. definitely towards that way. And I mean, there are passages that allude to things. Again, there's nothing outright. Right. I think of uh, David talks about seeing his child who died. He talks about seeing that child again. Uh, we see some interesting things in the Psalms uh, about David saying that he knew the Lord from the womb. I have no idea how that works. Right. <laughs> A poetic language, some, I, you know, we just don't know. And that's really what it boils down to is we don't know. And I, I've said this before in some of our early discussions. It presents a problem for us, but it does not present a problem for God. Right. You know, he's good. He's good. He's just. Yeah. And whatever he decides is the right choice. Yeah. And he's just in both. I appreciate you saying that, Joey. There's, there really is no passage that says one way or the other. Yeah. But you're absolutely right. Just because it doesn't, doesn't make God less good yeah. or less gracious. And it doesn't make the Bible any less true. Yeah. 
Um, but I think what we do have to be careful of is listening to ministers and pastors preaching that the Bible does say explicitly one way or the other way. Yeah. Because, I mean, we're just trying to be as honest as possible here. Yeah. The Bible doesn't give a clear-cut answer. There's no verse that no. says yeah. exactly And if it did, we would we would have said that a we long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> that would have been, yeah. man, that would have been great. Yeah, um, And Joey's other logical conclusion was if we start to say that babies are infant or that are innocent, then we start to draw upon, well, then how does one maintain that innocence throughout life that they would, yeah. you know, live a sinless life like Jesus did? Yeah. Well, obviously we cannot. Yeah. But that yeah. starts to you start to create a separate argument that one could potentially eradicate temptation and sin from their lives by maintaining that childlike innocence at mm -hmm. some way. They're, they're and that takes away from the gospel, which yeah. is what Joey said. And, and in light of innocence, that like they're, they're guilty in light of Adam's guilt. Yeah. So that has like flowed down through yeah. humanity, if, yeah. that, if right. that makes that sense. That infected all of humanity. Yeah, because yeah. yes. like, yeah. we tend to think of guilt like, Oh, you know, Josh, you're guilty of that thing you did the other day. But like the infants <laughs> didn't do anything except yeah. cry and poop and sleep. Right. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, yeah. But that's still like right. that sin nature yeah. would be in them because yeah. of what Adam did. Yeah. So anyway, I, I would just throw this isn't really our main topic today, but I would just throw this out there like as a pastoral note. Um, you know, I'm sure there are a lot of people that have dealt with this. I know at least one of us has. Yeah. Um, and I would say if you want to talk with us further, you know, get in contact with us because there's a lot more to say about this. Um, so but I'll just say and I echo what you guys have said. I lean yeah. toward these. These infants are in heaven with Jesus. OK. Yeah. Not out of my emotional <laughs> appeal, but because of what I see in Scripture. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. Excellent. Excellent. So. We can get back to the original question. Which really kind of redirects again, no one can be righteous of their own doing right. before the Lord. So going back through that avenue, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so no one can be righteous. So we're talking about this person that's never heard the gospel. If we say in faith is... Uh, your salvation is, is dependent on grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone, then we're saying that this guy that lives on this island is not saved. Mm -hmm. Right. This isolated person or tribe or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what about someone who, like the remark that Jesus, there, you know, this, uh, the objection that comes up says, well, but what about Jesus saying that every nation will hear or every tribe will confess or something like that something before like every, the end? Yeah, that would every, be like the every, sign that the end is here. Basically, every tribe or people group is represented, um, you know, and it's like, well, how do you even reconcile that? Because they're look at look at like like Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, uh, cities that were just wiped out. Um, you know, there, there are theories and one theory is, well, there were infants there that were wiped out as well. Sure. So maybe that's how they're represented, um, in, in the end. Uh, I don't know. Right. Right. And, and then there's also, well, what about all the folks that have passed before yeah. he comes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that question I think has been used in sort of our po like the cultural Christianity that we've grown up in as sort of a way to maintain a hope that every nation will hear about the gospel and then Jesus will return. But it doesn't, it fails to take into account all the folks that have lived until then, never heard and passed away. Yeah. Um, so it, it's kind of given us sort of a false it's not used in the context, I don't think, that it was meant to be used, but it's one that people have used over the years to sort of defend that, well, when, when we get to the point that everyone hears, like that will somehow redeem all those who haven't heard. You know, uh, you guys just made me think of Naaman. Do you remember him? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this is a guy. Sickly guy. Yeah, he's sick. You know, he's not of... Uh, he's not of Israel. He's not of God's chosen people. Right. He'd never heard of Yahweh to, to our knowledge. 
Um, Yahweh is God's name. Anyway, uh, we're talking Old Testament here, and Naaman uh, hears of this prophet who could potentially heal his sickness, right? His skin disease, I believe it was. Yes. Yeah. And so he, he goes and, and um, uh, basically the prophet's like, just go over and wash yourself seven times in that, in that lake or pool or whatever, and you'll be healed, right? And he eventually does this, um, but he's so impressed with Yahweh that he's like, hey, can I take some of this dirt home with me? What? Like, why would you take some of the dirt home? Well, it's because when he when he goes back home, he has a job, and his job is to help out uh, the king of his nation who serves other gods. And this king needs help, like, bowing down to other gods, and he's like, you know what? Uh, I, I, I hope that none of that would ever be seen as me, you know, worshiping these gods. I have to do what I have to do, but I want to bring some dirt with me so that I can worship the true God. My point to all of this is Naaman had to hear about it. Yeah. Like if he never met that prophet, he prob he may not have ever heard about this God of Israel. He has to be told. He had to be told. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's, you know what? There's another story, Cornelius. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I can talk about that. Uh, Cornelius in, in Acts 10, uh, verse 2, we find that Cornelius is this, this God-fearing man who is in good standing with the Jews uh, because he, he gives generously. Uh, but then an angel of the Lord uh, comes to Cornelius, and he's like, you got to send for, for Peter. Uh, you need to hear from Peter. And Peter has a vision. Uh, and so some of Cornelius' men uh, come to Peter, and they say, look, you got to come back with us uh, so you can talk to, talk to this guy Cornelius for us. And so Peter goes, and he meets with Cornelius and his family and other Gentiles. And so this God-fearing man, Cornelius, is not saved until Peter brings the gospel to him. And, and in this, uh, people repent and believe, and, and the Holy Spirit comes upon them. Uh, but until that moment, it wasn't enough for Cornelius to be God-fearing or to do good by his neighbors or, or, or to give generously. Uh, he had to have the explicit news that, that Peter was bringing to him in order that he might be saved. But, but Josh... <laughs> It says that he was righteous. Yeah. yeah. Can I go read this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Come on, Josh. You, you got to know this, man. Oh, I'm sorry. It says, <laughs> Acts 10, verse 2, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. I mean, that's probably better than most of us. Probably. Yeah. Verse 22, they said, Cornelius a centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man, well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews, was divinely directed by a holy angel to send for you and to come to his house. So he was a righteous man, God-fearing, prayed probably more than any of us. And you're saying he's not saved? Yeah, I, I, that is what I'm saying. And <laughs> <laughs> Go for it, Josh. You because it. even, I think... It, we talked about Isaiah. We didn't get an exact reference earlier, but even our, our good deeds, apart from God, apart uh, from the salvific work of Christ, are like filthy rags. Mm -hmm. And so this prayer, his giving, uh, it, it is not good enough. It, this, his works are not good enough. And, and my, uh, my ESV in verse 22 says, says that he is upright uh, and God-fearing. And this is coming from... Uh, one of the men that he had sent. So I would maybe argue that man's uh, definition of righteous, sure. man's definition of being upright is is not good enough and is not uh, the same or equated to what God considers righteous. I concede. <laughs> but Acts 11, verse 14, well, start at verse 13. He says, And he reported to us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa. And have Simon, who is called Peter, brought here, and he will speak words to you by which you will be saved, you and all your household. So even though we have Cornelius here who is 
I'll concede righteousness may have been by the people, but was still God fearing and prayed yes. continually. He still wasn't saved. No. And so this this takes into another kind of a, a Western Christian perspective. Like, what about Jews? Right? So they also fear, like the nation of Israel, God fearing Jews. They also fear God. Are they in the same boat as Cornelius? Well, and lump Paul into that discussion. Sure. Because he, oh, was, he was yeah, a Jew. That's, that's good. And he didn't know Jesus until, you know, Jesus showed himself. Knocked him off his horse. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you can, I think you can think that you're a God fearing person. You can do all the right things. You can go to church every Sunday or watch online church at this point (laughs) or go to Sunday school (laughs) or watch online Sunday school, whatever you check off all these boxes, but that doesn't save you. Yeah. Right. But we, we definitely in this, this Western Christianity, this American Christianity, we have like a special place for some reason, uh, for, for Jews thinking that because they were God's chosen people, that they will have a special place because they fear God. And we somehow just nullify the whole part about them rejecting the promised Messiah, and which, is in, which is in the sermon in Acts, mm-hmm. where he's like, this is what you did. You crucified yeah. the man that was sent to save you. And they ask, what, what should we do? Repent of your sins so you'd be saved. So the whole perspective is for whatever reason it is in, in, in American Christianity, we have this special place that doesn't, it, it's actually contrary to what the Bible teaches us about him, but we have this special place reserved for Jews who fear God, thinking that God will do something for them special. Um, but you're right. Based on the story of Cornelius, based on Paul's testimony. Yeah. It's belief in Jesus Christ alone, not fearing of God. You know what, Chris? I fell into that camp <clears throat> early on uh, when I was a teenager and investigating things myself and finally starting to actually read the Bible. Um, like, what is it with this nation of Israel? This, like, wh- what's so special about right. them? They're literally called, you know, God's uh, treasured possession. You know, well, that doesn't... I mean, what's so special about I'm not Jewish, so I guess I'm not part of him, his chosen people or his treasured possession. Sure. Uh, but the, I think my problem was I didn't understand the whole story of Scripture uh, and how Israel fit into that. I mean, their purpose was to bring the other nations back to Yahweh, yeah. but they continually, they just continually failed. Uh, they, scripture says they would abandon him. They committed adultery against him by serving other gods. Um, I mean, something needed to be done. Right. And from day one, uh, God had that planned, and it was Jesus. Um, so, you know, it, it's not, it's, yes, Israel was his chosen nation, but why did he choose them? Well, he chose them to bring the rest of people back, um, bring the nations back, and ultimately, um, you know, now we see, you know, we talked about Paul bringing the message of Christ to the Gentiles, yeah. not just yeah. the Jews, uh, to the, to the world, to the whole world. I mean, I could make a case for that's always been true, right. which I think I just did actually. But, <laughs> um, you know, so it's from page one of the Bible all the way through the end, we see God pursuing yeah. people yeah. out of his love. He, he wants us to choose him the question is are we going to choose him or not yeah um his loyalty is never questioned it's always our loyalty to him that's questioned yes um because we have that choice all right but what i mean it just doesn't seem fair like that's like another objection where it just simply does not seem fair that this is how it would work the reality is if it was fair, we'd all be going to hell. It wasn't fair, and I mean, if you if you if we're really understanding the doctrine of sin that we see in our Bibles, right? We are sinners, right? How is it fair that Jesus died, right? How is it fair that we go to heaven? Really, the the question should be, why is it why is it fair? Uh, how is it fair that somebody God could you know uh, withhold the gospel from somebody, or how is it fair? that God sends them to hell because they didn't hear the gospel. 
and yet we never ask, how is it even fair that I have heard the gospel? Right. How is it fair that I get to hear the gospel? Yeah. And that I responded, at least yeah. in, a, in a way that I wanted to glorify him in it. Yeah. yeah. We'll get to talk about that, I think, in another week, mm. about how God call whether we, you know, we hear and respond and how that all works. Um, but so there's kind of this idea of what is fair. And I think you're right, Joey. We, when we ask that question, we're not thinking of the part where we deserve death. Yeah. We deserve eternal punishment. How is it fair that a sinless man went on the cross and paid the price for, let's not mistaken, mistake this the entire world yep. paid the price for the sins of the entire world oh yeah and i have shared the gospel with many people some do not like it mm-hmm. so i mean i could be like how is it fair but they would say i'm ridiculous and that's their perspective on on, on what i believe so i mean there's also that but it's not really fair at least in the way that we think of fairness yeah because we think of it should be only fair that everyone just gets a free ticket, I guess. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, I think as a parent of a teenager and an older and an older child, right, still in elementary school, but I get that question all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not that's fair. That's not fair. It's <laughs> not fair. You know what, though? Uh, I'm the parent, <laughs> and I have the best interests in mind for my children right why because i love them and i know that what i'm moving them toward or pushing them toward or the 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 guidelines that i'm setting are for their benefit they can choose to disobey or obey but at the end of the day it's for their benefit um and it's it's not really about what's fair it's about do i love them or not right and with God being our father. I mean, he, what, what greater love than this, that, right. that someone would lay down their life for them. And that's exactly what God did for us. Sure. He proved how much he loved us. It's not even really about a question of fairness. It's a, it's a, it's about a question of, do you believe the reality in which we live? Right. right. And, and that we have a loving father who wants you back in, in his family. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's up to you. You He's, he's, I mean, unless, unless he plants himself down on the road to Damascus again, <laughs> like, like he did to Paul, right. you know, I mean, I mean, even then Paul still had to choose, but still it's like, we don't really get that. We don't always get that lightning moment, <laughs> you know, yeah. where, mm-hmm. where we like get to meet him face to face. That's, I like how you talked about how as a parent, what you're doing actually is for the benefit of your children. Yeah. Like I think about, I mean, we say, oh, it's, it's not fair for people who haven't heard the gospel. Uh, what about the gospel is bad? Like Jesus Christ is the actual source of life. That's the best thing for somebody to hear about. You know, it, 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 if they're going to be saved, uh, it's not like, oh, it's unfair. It's actually the, the best possible thing for them to hear. Mm-hmm is Christ himself, is to hear from his word. And so I think it's kind of funny how we say, oh, it's like, how do I phrase it? It's not fair for somebody to go to hell who hasn't heard the gospel uh, because it seems like this just like this little tiny thing, I guess you could say, like this little, just flip a light switch on, oh, they're, they're fine now. No, the, what we're talking about with the gospel is so big, so grand, so yeah. beautiful, and, and Christ is so good. And it, it, let me put it this way. It's like, oh, it's not fair for somebody to go, go to hell if they haven't heard the only way for them to go to heaven. Right. If that makes sense. Yes. I don't know if I'm trying to put it uh, in. I'm trying to convey my thoughts in words. It's like, where would you find salvation elsewhere, I guess, is the point I'm getting at. Right. And whenever somebody says that's not fair, I always jump to Exodus 33, 19, uh, which says, and he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Mm. That's like the ultimate flex from God. Like, he he, is is totally in control. And sometimes we're like, we're maybe like Job at the end of Job, where he's he's shouting at God or questioning God and saying, "How how is this fair? How can you do this to me? 
and God points to creation and says, could you even run this for a day? Do you, do you right. know what it's like to be me? Were you right. there when I laid down the <laughs> foundations of the, of the world? Do you yeah. understand yeah. how that's fair? Yeah, and he's like, yeah. because I am who I am, I get to make that call. And so in God's justice, that, that is, he makes those calls with certain people. Yeah, he does. I tend to find our arguments, you know, like, oh, it's not fair, all these different things really is just coming from a heart oftentimes that doesn't want to be responsible for sharing the gospel. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's usually, I mean, I think about it, you know, my own life, ways that's manifested itself. Oh, try and make excuses so you don't have to share. But the reality is, is that Christ has made a way. He is the only way, and he's told us to go and tell about him. Yeah, and mm-hmm. he will provide ways for you to tell. Yeah. I mean, talk about Jonah. Yeah, yeah. So Jonah... uh I'm preparing a sermon uh, on Jonah soon, and uh, just reading it is so fascinating. You know, at the beginning of the book, God is essentially saying, go and evangelize. And it's really interesting, too, because even, God even says, go and tell them that they are wicked and need to repent. You know, there's something we don't talk about often is telling somebody about their sin. Go tell people that they're wicked. Yeah. Go tell (laughs) someone that they're sinful. No wonder, I mean, the gospel is offensive to so many because what they're hearing is, oh, you're saying I'm an evil person? I don't want to believe that. (laughs) <laughs> right. and, and so this is what God is saying go and evangelize to the Ninevites and it's really beautiful actually because in the book of Jonah it, it, he, not, God's not saying go and tell them they're evil as a holier than thou type thing God loves the Ninevites I mean he uh, I, I love the end of Jonah where he talks about like look Jonah you love that little plant and you didn't even make it look at what all I made I made these people in the city I right. made them from their from the mother's womb on they are I have made this right and what you say I don't have a right to have pity on them and have mercy. Right. God loves people, and he wants to see nations saved. Um, and so we go back to, again, at the beginning of Jonah. God says, go and evangelize. And what does Jonah do? He runs the other way. <laughs> he <laughs> didn't want to. He runs further away <laughs> yeah. right. than going to evangelize. But how often do we do that? Right. How often? I mean, it's a sobering mm-hmm. thing. You know, uh, just to re- when you look at the book of Jonah, the, the Bible project put it this way. It's like looking at a mirror. Yeah. of yourself uh, and we're not you know we like to think oh I would never do that no we're exactly like Jonah look, look how ridiculous Jonah looks right here yeah. this is a terrible look Jonah you're like hiding under a leaf <laughs> yeah. and and running away and getting swallowed up by large fish so this was a kind of a ridiculous beautiful story yeah but you're like look look at yourself but you're right it's a mirror yeah. so we should be saying okay Chris Stop being so ridiculous. This is God's people whom he has created and he loves. To tell them that he's, that they're wicked is to create in them a need for God to be present in their lives. It's just to confront them with truth. Unfortunately, truth is extremely offensive these days. Yeah. Um, But it's truth nonetheless. And God's will is he desires for all to be saved. Sends, sends Jonah, sends Paul to the Gentiles, eventually Peter to Cornelius. I mean, he, God does, seeks after these people and he's sending us. We have the great commission given to us to go into the world, not to build churches, but to make disciples. That's right. Yeah. Who make disciples, who make disciples. I don't know how anybody who reads the New Testament could come to the conclusion that we don't need to share our faith. Mm. That's, that's what it's all about. Uh, That's why the writers are writing with such an urgency. Right. Mm. Uh, I mean, why do, why did they write so passionately against false gospels Mm. if there wasn't a one true gospel? It doesn't make any sense. We, we are, com- as you said, we are commissioned by Jesus himself, God, to go and, and get the, his message to the world. Mm-hmm. He chooses to use us in this way. Yeah. By the way, that's actually his will. That's his overarching will. That's part of his overarching like, plan for his creation, of bringing people back into his family. He chooses to use us. The problem is we have the choice of whether or not to follow his will or not. But I would argue, like, if we're not actually speaking, you know, using our words 
telling others about Jesus were not in God's will. Mm. Right. Yeah. Period. And I think kind of going along with that, for me, the ultimate nail in the coffin, if you will, of inclusivism is that if you take that philosophy or ideology to its logical end, isn't it ultimately more loving to not share the gospel right. with somebody who doesn't know? Because they're saying, oh, this person doesn't know. Well, God will save them anyway. But then if you share the gospel with them, you now give them a choice in which they can ultimately fail and end up in God's wrath. But no, the, the New Testament says quite the opposite, like you were saying, yeah. Scott. And yeah. we are not urged, but commanded yes. to, to share our faith. Absolutely. Uh, with words, not just with actions. Words, right. <laughs> right. Actions are important. Actions, are, actions are the fruit of our loyalty and belief in Jesus. Right. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're just a natural offspring. I mean, this is how we choose to live in God's will. Uh, but ultimately, our purpose for being here is to, uh, you know, as God's treasured possession, to bring others back into his family, mm-hmm. uh, to be his. I would even say that's that's what it means to be made in the image of God. We're to be his image. We're to bear mm-hmm. his name right. uh, to the nations yeah. and to our neighbors. You know, it's not just right. overseas missions, but it's to our neighbors, our neighbors as well. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So. So we have Romans 10, verse 14. Uh, this might be kind of one of our takeaways here. Yeah. Is how well, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him who they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. And so for even, we have the Great Commission, we also have this, these words here from Paul that are telling us that they can't have faith in Christ unless somebody tells them about Christ. And so how will that happen unless we go, yeah. unless we tell, unless we share? And we just, we want to believe that by our good nature, whatever that is, our good actions, whatever that is, the people will just sort of through osmosis come to understand what it is we're about. And so we might say, well, it's because I was kind to the person in line at the grocery store this week because I was nice. They will know about Jesus. I mean, that's the, I mean, that's terrible when I say it out loud, but that's the kind of things that we do Yeah. because I bought Mm. the latte in the, Starbucks line behind me. I paid for it. Somehow that will be some sort of redeeming factor. Um, they will know that, oh, why would he do that? It must be Christ's love in him. None of those things say Christ's love. They just say you were a nice guy today. Mm-hmm. The only way that somebody will know is if you tell them about Jesus. Yeah, I've, uh, I've heard it said, and it's not about a presentation. It's about a conversation. Right. Because... Mm-hmm. Um, I'm probably one of the more awkward people to just, <laughs> go, it's just not. I'm, I think we're I'm, all going to say that, right? Yeah. I, I think maybe, everybody and the person behind that's watching this is probably going to be like, I'm, that's me. But I'm for real, man. Like, <laughs> like I've tried it, you know, many times going up to people in the streets and it's just like some, some are willing to listen. Others no, And I, and I always just feel like <sighs> sharing the gospel uh, involves a bit of, intentional work um yeah you know i think of when i used to work uh at a furniture store i mean i i i wanted to become better friends with these guys that i worked with uh not just for the sake of being friends but also because you know when opportunities did come up to talk about the gospel i wanted them to know that they could trust me you know, and how do you do that uh, as someone who just comes up on the streets or yells at you with a megaphone? Um, you know, I'm not saying there isn't any value right. oh, yeah. in street evangelism. 
I'm just saying that I think a lot of us are wired different ways. Right. Um, but at the end of the day, we're all called whatever way this looks like. We, we as followers of Jesus are called to uh, share the good news. Um, and I think maybe one of the, and this is probably rabbit trailing, but I think one of the biggest issues is people just simply don't know how to explain the good news. Mm. Right. So, so that, you know, part of that's on us as teachers and preachers to consistently bring that before them and show them, like, here's, here's how we do this. And we did that today. We presented the gospel. So anybody watching this ought to know, you know, <laughs> what exactly that is. It was one of the objectives in the beginning, you know, the student will be able to articulate the gospel. Yes. It, yeah. Yeah. So good. Yeah. This, and it, we've heard, we've used this before, maybe in one of the videos and maybe in one of the podcasts we've done, but like the Francis Assisi statement, which I think you could say better than I can because <laughs> you've already done it like twice this morning. <laughs> yeah. yeah uh, preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. And it's a phrase like this that we use to sit back and not preach yeah. because we it gives us we we feel more comfortable just doing nice things for people mm-hmm. instead of bringing up Jesus in conversation yeah. but like what you said Scott about your coworkers I did the same thing I worked at in at UPS for 10 years and what I had was a relationship with my coworkers where we talked about family we talked about kids, spouses, um, relationships. We talked about parents. We talked about all those things. And in every one of those situations, I made sure that from my perspective, I talked about what I thought, like how you should respond because this is what Christ taught Mm -hmm. me and how I do it. So whenever it was like, man, I'm having problems with my parents right now because they don't want to do X, Y, and Z. Like, have you ever come in contact with this? I would give my perspective and then talk about why I believe that that's how you should respond mm-hmm. because of Christ. It was a part of everything, it seasoned everything that I said. Yeah. But you had to have that relationship, I think. Yeah. It wasn't, I wasn't doing the street evangelism in the parking lot. I was doing that like while we work and we're talking right. about family. And, and that's friends. our culture. There's other cultures on the planet that the street evangelism works very well. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, but at least here where we live seems to be that's, that's yeah. what it is because... Right. You know, if some stranger comes up and starts talking to us, we run the other way. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. But the Bible is clear. We are without excuse, at least as far as sharing. Yeah. I have actually a, a, a verse uh, or two to read about that. Thank you. Ezekiel 3, uh, starting at verse 18. This is God speaking, and this is really sobering. Sure. If I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way, in order to save his life, that wicked person shall die for his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. That's really heavy. Yeah, that's heavy. That's really, really heavy. The first thing I uh, first thing I think of is thank God for Jesus Christ, yeah. who pays for the sins in which I fail at evangelism. Right. I mean, so many people, and that whole like, preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. It doesn't fly here. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't not, fly. Not at all. Right. It doesn't fly one bit. Um, we have to start looking at people as souls, right? Perishing souls who need the grace of God through His Word. I've 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 said I've used the illustration before. The people uh, who don't know Jesus are literally like the Walking Dead. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, we often love to quote John three sixteen, but what about the next couple verses? I mean, the implications are if you don't know Jesus, you're already condemned, mm. right. condemned to hell. If, right. if that's what you know, if we want to, what happens to someone who never heard the gospel? This person who can make conscious, rational decisions, as I would say, uh, yeah, they're not going to be with God. Mm. I don't know what your definition of hell is doesn't sound like a nice place. Right. Sounds like a real place. Doesn't sound like a nice place. Um, you know, there's, there's, that's why there's such an urgency to tell people. And the it's on good us. News. The good news. Yeah. I don't it's know about us. any other good news that we keep hidden so well. Yeah. <laughs> right? If there's good food in the city, like we go tell people, like, have you tried the cheesesteaks? 
you know, have you tried? I'm not going to say any particular restaurants because I don't want to make anybody mad. But so if you, if you tried <laughs> their food, you know, we would talk about that in a heartbeat. Yep. This is like the one of the strangest things in our culture yeah. to have such good yeah. news in our laps at our fingertips even and to not and to walk around and not tell anyone yeah. about I, it. I would. I, so I would uh, counsel any any Christian who anyone who would call themselves a Jesus follower. Um. There's this one little book I read a long time ago by Brother Lawrence, and his approach to living was not necessarily moment by moment, but like all throughout his life, and no matter what he did, uh, he would have this continual conversation uh, with Jesus. It was a life lived in continual prayer, that kind of stuff. But like the same, the same applies to you know how we live our life. Like if, if our life, if we're saying we're Christian, our, our life, like that faith isn't just a thing we do. It is a foundational thing that we put our life on. Yeah. Um, so, you know, bringing God up really shouldn't be all that hard. Uh, if you're, <laughs> if you're actually, you know, in the word, you're reading the word, you're going to church, that kind of stuff. Like it is a part of your life. How, how could you not talk about it? Uh, you know, and I'm I'm adding that to the already obvious part where there's an urgency right. to talk about it. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm just saying, if we're really living it, if it, if it's like just the DNA of yep. what makes us who we are, then how could we not talk about it? I'll, t- I'll tell you what my professor told me in my undergrad was that you have to weigh out the question: Does your fear of God outweigh your fear of man? Mm. Mm. So like Mm. uh, that was uh, it was something that he was teaching me as I went into his office to basically be corrected and sort of rebuked on on the way that I had presented a particular lesson in one of our teaching classes. Um, And as he was going through it, he's like, you need to write or put somewhere or or just remember that it's better to be biblically correct than to be politically correct. Because your fear of God needs to outweigh your fear of man. And so you, basically you need to like preach every gospel like it may be your last time. Mm. Preach every sermon like it's the last one you will preach or the last one they will hear. Yeah. That actually reminds me of a little, it's, I'm going to quote an excerpt from a poem, a Puritan poem. I preach is never sure to preach again and as a dying man to dying men. Yeah. So that was something that I had put on my sermons and put in my text for a long time towards the top and the margins like, You know, like there's going to be times I'm going to read stuff and I'm going to be like, I don't know if I like this or whatever. So I'll make something else like the larger point in the text. You know, like I'll I'll draw more from something else and soften some of that. And so basically what I mean, he was saying, like, if this is the last time you're preaching and this is the last time that they're hearing, make sure that they understand the good news. Yeah. And not something else. You haven't left them with something else to go home with not something that just to make them feel good yeah. not something that just told them how to live better mm-hmm. something that told them their need for Jesus Christ is far greater than anything else so and I would even add to that like if if, if you're saying if someone out there is saying I'm a, I'm a Christian but I don't know really how to explain the gospel that's okay but you have some homework to do right like, mm-hmm. go for it yeah. go for like, it like seek our counsel or just open up the scripture and start reading it mm-hmm. uh, because if, if we're going to be a follower of Jesus uh, part of that spiritual maturity is like we have to know his message yeah. we have to know it we can't use not knowing it as an excuse to not talk about him yeah so thanks guys yeah, yeah. thank you hey thanks for joining us and if you enjoyed that uh, we actually have a podcast it's called the LS Collective Podcast where we talk about questions of faith in Jesus. Uh, So there's a lot of different topics that we have. You can find us on your favorite podcast app, or you can just head on over to our website, lscollectivepodcast.com. See you next time.